Welcome to the 2014 Salisaw Mayor and Chief of Police Candidate Forum. I'm Jeff Mayo, co-chair of the Chamber of Commerce Legislative Committee and general manager of the Sequoia County Times. This forum is co-sponsored by KXMX, the Mix 105.1, the Sequoia County Times, and the Salisaw Chamber of Commerce. I want to thank People Incorporated for allowing us to hold this event here tonight in their conference center. The Chamber's Legislative Committee meets one Friday a month during the Oklahoma Legislative Session to hear from our senator and representatives about issues important to Salisaw and the county. We also host these election forms uh, when they're uh, available and, and when it's an election year. I want to recognize our committee members. Uh, some of here, some here are here tonight. Some couldn't make it. Gary Winton is the co-chair of the Legislative Committee, and he's the current Chamber President. Gary's right down here in front. Brooke Lattimore is with the Health and uh, Wellness Center. Brooke is right on the front. Stephen Hires is from the Cherokee Nation. Frank Sullivan III, the local attorney. And Julie Ferguson. Uh, Julie, because Ms. Ferguson's a candidate, um, she has not participated in the planning of our forum. Our moderator tonight is Marley Abel. He's the immediate past president of the Chamber of Commerce and a member of our legislative committee. Marley's down in front with the microphone. This event is being aired live on 105.1 The Mix. Tomorrow, a tape-delayed broadcast will be uh, shown on Diamondette Channel 19. It will be replayed several times over the coming weeks. The audio of the form will be available on the Mix's website, kxmx.com, and their mobile apps to listen to it any time. And I believe it will be available about 15 minutes after the conclusion of tonight's event. I want to thank the candidates for being here. For Mayor, Shannon Van is the incumbent, and Julie Ferguson is the challenger. Mrs. Ferguson is also a current city commissioner. For police chief, the two challengers are Terry Franklin and Sandy Gardner. The format for tonight's event. Each candidate will be given three minutes to make introductory remarks. Then we'll have a 15-minute break. During this time, we will accept questions from the audience at the table here at the front. We'll have cards available to fill out with your question, and I believe the cards might be already circulating. If you can't find a card, please see Ms. Robin Eckers in the back. Um, she has cards that are available. If we, if we, the candidates, if we don't ask your question tonight, the candidates will get your cards afterwards. So please include your name and contact information so that the candidate the question is directed to, or if it's directed to a particular office, both candidates will get the question so that they can contact you directly with an answer. While we will not be announcing who asked the particular question, we ask that all cards have your name on them so the candidates will have the opportunity to contact you. We want to limit tonight's forum to 90 minutes. Um, and so we will ask the number of questions we can once we start in the question period, but we're not going to be here all night. After we resume, each candidate will be given two or three minutes, depending on a question to answer. There are some that are two-part questions that we've already received by email, and, and, and our committee has decided that two minutes just is not enough time to answer some of them, so we'll allow for three minutes, and you all and the candidates will know before that question is asked. Uh, Mr. Winton is timing the event tonight, and will signal to Ms. Martins uh, as time counts down. There will be a sign for one minute remaining, 30 seconds remaining, <laughs> and stop. And if you'll notice, the cards are double-sided, so the audience knows, just like the candidates do, when they're supposed to stop. We hope this helps. Um, because this is a forum and not a debate, there will be no time for rebuttal comments from the candidate who answers the question first. We will rotate who goes first with each question. Keeping with past forms, the challenger in the mayor's race will go first, then the incumbent on their opening statement. And with the police chief's race, we have Mr. Gardner going first. I want to thank the candidates for being here. It is vital to our community that we have people willing to run for office and work for what they believe in. It is also vital that they have the opportunity to share their views with us and that there's someone here to listen and be heard. I appreciate all of you all for being here tonight and all those who are listening and watching later on. Um, I honestly believe these candidates love Salisaw as much as I do, and I'm very happy for them all to be here. Let's give them a round of applause. With that, I'll turn it over to Marley. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we're going to go ahead and do the introductories now, and we will start with the uh, Office of Mayor, and we'll start with uh, Ms. Julie Ferguson. Thank you, Marley. Thank you all for coming tonight. It's a pleasure to see you all, and it's an honor to be here and have the privilege of running for mayor. I'm Julie Ferguson, and I would like to be your next mayor. I have 38 years of experience in municipal government and the last 17 and a half with the city of Salisaw. I came here uh, with an industry, and I believe that we can bring more industry to town. I think we can recruit. I know what it takes to recruit industry. I know what it, it means to an industry to have somebody contact them. We need to recruit industry for our, uh, our 
industrial park and and create uh, retail opportunities for those who would like to go into the retail business. I think that we can do all of this. Um, the company that I came with uh, looked for specific things, and as a company, they don't tell you everything that they look for, but there are uh, opportunities for us to do this. I think I have vision for the future. I think what we need is a strategic plan to know where we are, where we're going, and what we hope to achieve. I think we need to have more transparency in our city hall for business downtown, work with businesses to help them grow and expand, and if there's a, an empty building and someone wants to occupy it, work with uh, opportunities for investors to come in and, and improve our community. In addition, I think we should uh, bring our beauty back. We have we have had a beautiful place in the past, and we have a good place to live. We have opportunities to make it look prettier. We can do ma better maintenance and put some put some uh, uh, thought and effort in how we can create more uh, opportunities for um, people to help us make it look good. I think our strategic plan it will help us get us where we need to go, and I I think that we need to help uh, our industries that are here and to bring in more for them, and we will have opportunities for uh, job opportunities for our students who go off to college and, and a way for them to stay at home. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here, and I want to thank you all for being here also. And it's a pleasure to serve the city as a city commissioner now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Ferguson. We'll go now to uh, Mr. Shannon Van. First, let me uh, thank the Chamber of Commerce and uh, KXMX for uh, putting this form together and People Inc. for uh, hosting tonight. So let me start by saying it's been a privilege and honor to have served as your mayor since 2002. Uh, we've accomplished a lot in that time. We've built uh, new water uh, treatment facilities. We've built new intake structures on Brushy Lake. We've built a new supply line for Brushy Lake. Uh, we've also built a new industrial building in the industrial park uh, for cellophane, and which has uh, since led to expansion twice by that company in the industrial park. Along with that, we built developed a new road to uh, open up access for future growth in that park. Along with those ideals, we, uh, we built a fiber to the home and fiber to the business system, which uh, provided availability of better services for our businesses and our residents in the community. Fire department buildings have been expanded and capacity has been added by the addition of a ladder truck, which helped result in a lower fire rating for Salisaw. More recently, we've worked with uh, Cherokee Chief Bill John Baker and Council Member David Thornton to, and others uh, to help get uh, Blue River Downs property cleaned up and uh, with hopes of some future improvement and, and uh, you know, some type of future use out there. So, I want to address a negative that's been in our community recently head on. The recent controversy over the police chief's alleged actions and debate by some as to handling of these allegations continues. There were other allegations beyond the embezzlement allegation that needed to be investigated. In October, uh, I was made aware that the OSBI was finally investigating these other allegations. It is my understanding this was prompted by a new allegation made to an outside law enforcement agency. I was also advised by the sheriff that he had been in contact with the city attorney and city manager at that time regarding the possibility of the chief resigning. We do not know the results of the investigation, and the chief remains innocent until proven guilty if even charges are even filed. I only bring this up because I'm tired of the lies and the attacks levied against me and other members of the city council and city staff. I will take whatever actions are appropriate to protect the citizens regardless of elected officials such as our state representative and former Chief Edwards and making political threats to coerce me and others to ignore or not report possible wrongdoing. As you can see, the challenges have been many and varied. New challenges have arisen, and I'm confident the city will rise to meet them. The recession our entire nation has been in since 2009 and only recently seeing signs of life and improving across the country, we're seeing those same signs here in this community. New housing has started. You, the voters, have approved improvements to our school, dis school district with a new middle school, as well as a long-awaited sports complex that's been talked about for many, many years that was uh, brought forth by many citizens years ago as an ideal that this community needed. We have created our own, our own momentum by investing in a tough time knowing that better days are ahead. Investments by you in water infrastructure, education, roads, quality of life, 
projects such as sports complex will lead to better days. We will continue to work to improve South on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van. Uh, we'll move now to the uh, chief of police race, and we'll start with Ms. Sandra Gardner. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Chamber of Commerce and Mix 105.1. Thank you for inviting me here this evening to the forum. My name is Sandy Gardner, candidate for Salisaw Chief of Police. I want to start off with a little bit about my history. I started here at the Salisaw Police Department in 1992. I started marking tires pretty big deal to me at that time. I had moved on. I found many other jobs that seemed to fit me for a while, but I moved on again to something more. In 1995, I became Salisaw's first female police officer, full-time position. I worked there for five years in patrol and moved on to Detective Division in 2000. During that Detective Division, I moved on to Lieutenant, where I oversaw the um, detectives and the school resource officers, in which that's the position I hold today. I supervise over the sexual assault, child abuse, domestic violence, and all other major crimes. <clears throat> needless, <clears throat> excuse me, needless to say, I am a busy woman. I try to stay busy as much as I can with anything that needs to be done. My husband and I attend Eastside Baptist Church. We are involved in lots of civil civic activities within our church and the community. We also have three children, and we have nine grandchildren, and one on the way. It's going to be a little busier, it looks like, with those kids. As your next chief of police, I'm confident that I will serve the citizens of Salisaw with integrity and honesty, and provide a new vision for the Salisaw Police Department that will lead us further into the future. Thank you for allowing me to be here tonight. I look forward to working with you all. Thank you, Ms. Gardner. Now ask Mr. Uh, Terry Franklin. See if I can get this thing fixed so you can hear me. Hello, I'm Terry Franklin. I'd like to say thank you for giving me the opportunity as a candidate for the Office of Chief of Police and extend the invitation to speak here tonight. I would also like to thank those present and listening on the radio and also watching on Diamond Net. I would also like to thank those who have supported me, and also my campaign. I've been married to my wife, Colleen, for 27 years. We have one son, Chris, and we attend First Missionary Baptist Church here in South. I decided to seek the office of Chief of Police because I believe that the citizens of South deserve the very best protection and services from the police department. And it has always been a desire of mine to one day to lead the police department to the future. And I am the one candidate that can do that. I will bring the police department my administrative and organizational skills. I have a plan to focus on community policing. With over 25 years of law enforcement experience, I can do the job as your chief. I have extensive knowledge of the police department's budgets and accounting records, evidence management, investigations, dispatch and jail, and patrol. 
I served as charter president of the South Salt Police Association. I'm a member of the Oklahoma Sheriff's Association. I'm also a member of the Oklahoma Chiefs Police Association. And with over 25 years of law enforcement experience, I can do the job as your chief. I'm now currently an investigator at the Squaw County Sheriff's Department. I retired from the South Salt Police Department as an administrative captain. All police department offices are under the supervision of the captains. When I am chief, we will have a working relationship with other law enforcement agencies. I feel an obligation to help create positive change for our community. It is my pleasure to return the Office of Chief back to the people. The time is now to develop a level of service second to none. I will stand accountable to the people. I will also hold my officers accountable, but I will also recognize them when they excel. One of the largest problems I see in the city is the community disconnect with law enforcement. The public's disgruntled because of the perception is no one cares. I want to change that. We can do that by dealing with the department issues, not just looking the other way. I hold an advanced law enforcement certificate. I attended Carl Albert State College. I'm the person for the job. I'm asking each of you for your vote on Tuesday, February 11, 2014. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Franklin, and thank all of you for your introductions. Uh, we'd like to take a brief 15-minute intermission at this time. Uh, during this time, you'll have the ability to submit questions of the candidates to the Legislative Committee uh, at the table that I'm sitting at currently uh, for review. Oh, we're going to do it over there. Sorry. Uh, your name must be on the question, although it will not be uh, read out loud. Any question that we do not ask live will be forwarded to the candidate or candidate uh, that is involved with the question tomorrow with your contact information so that they may respond directly to you at their discretion. Also, also we will not uh, ask any questions, obviously, uh, allowed that are considered personal attack in nature. Thank you very much. All right, so Kyle, what we've got going on here is basically now they're going to take questions from the audience. They were handed a uh, questionnaire whenever they come in, and they'll fill out this questionnaire, and then they'll be submitted. And if you have submitted your questions to the mix, at kxmx.com. Those also will be looked at. We will write those down, and we will also get those in as well. We appreciate those who have sent in their questions. We appreciate those who are here tonight uh, with their questions as well. The opening statements, um, a lot of, a lot of really, a lot. Uh, most of the candidates talked about change, what they can do to change, how they can help to change uh, the community. A lot of big issues to talk about here tonight. And uh, I think all candidates are ready for this form here tonight. Well, I think you're right. And I also think that it was a good positive field. Each candidate had positive things to say. Uh, we need to have, uh, you know, some of the candidates address issues head on. And, you know, that's what these forums are, are about. We want to address issues. We don't, uh, and we want to uh, make this something that the uh, people will come away and be informed with. And we hope we do that here tonight. So we're going to take a quick commercial break, and uh, we're going to be right back. You're listening to the Political Forum 2014 right here. On the mix, 105.1. You're listening to Meet the Candidates, a political forum that's brought to you by the Salisaw Chamber of Commerce, the Legislative Committee of the Salisaw Chamber of Commerce. I'm D along with Kyle Garner. Kyle, I've enjoyed it so far. Been really good. Opening statements were, were really well, went really well tonight. I thought there was, like you said, moments where we left. Uh, a lot of positive, a lot of good things to really go off of here tonight. I feel like each candidate is... Is, is prepared, and they know what they're going to say tonight, and they're ready for this, this event here tonight. That's right. And just for you listeners, just so you know exactly what's going on tonight. Now, what happened was we actually had the introduction and welcome, then the moderator came up, which is Marley Abel. We had introductory statements by each one of the four candidates, and right now what we're doing is they're going over the questions. We're having questions submitted here from the uh, audience that's in attendance as well as questions online if you would like we've already got some that's been submitted several as a matter of fact if you would like to submit a question for one of the candidates tonight or for both candidates you're certainly welcome to do so do so you can do that at the mix at kxmx.com and uh, also we want to we want to also thank those who have sent in questions as well we appreciate all those questions that everyone has sent in uh, like we said like Dee said moments ago what we're going to do after this they're taking an intermission right now what they're going to do is we're going to come back uh, with the question and answer session, and uh, each candidate is going to answer. Um, they're going to answer in a rotation, 
And uh, I believe they will start with mayoral candidates and then work their way into Dallas Hall Chief of Police candidates. So we're looking forward to that. So continue to send in your questions, and uh, we will get those over to the committee so they can review those and uh, get those on here. And you can hear those questions and answers live right here on the Mix 105.1. You know, some of the things that we decided that we wanted to share with you here tonight was actually share some of the roles and also some of the salaries, some of the different things like that, between the Salisaw mayor and also the chief of police. So we're going to kind of do that now while we're in an interim, and after we share this, we'll kind of share the role of mayor and what the city charter says and some of the responsibilities that they have. The role as mayor, he is actually the head of the city. The mayor officially speaks for both the government and the community as a whole. He's the official head of the city, as we said. The mayor usually serves as the city's representative before the Oklahoma legislature, federal agencies, and other type of local government type issues. The mayor usually greets the visitors that we have. Also, formal and informal talks takes place in public events. May often, mayor often uh, is uh, seen as an expert for our city in different city affairs, both on the state and national level, for those few times that he's involved in that, or she is. Executing official documents, power to make appointments, as well as presiding over a council meeting. You know, one of the, one of the things that we want to make sure and tell the people is that Dallas Hall actually has a commissioner, mayor. A, I'm sorry, a commissioner, city manager type of government. And and what that means is that basically means that the board of commissioners is composed of five people. That's the mayor and the four commissioners, one each from one of the wards. Then the uh, city manager is actually responsible for the running of the city. You know, speaking on the city commissioners, they actually, folks may not know out there, but they actually have a meeting each second Monday night. Uh, they will meet over uh, by the police station. There's an area over there where they'll actually meet up about 6.30 on the second Monday night of every month. They will actually discuss issues that are going on in the city and uh, talk about those. Now, I've actually said it on a couple of them, and they're actually... Now, people may think, oh, politics, you know, that may not be a very exciting thing, but they're actually pretty exciting. Sure. Actually, there's right. a lot of information that you can gather from those meetings. So we want to encourage people to also get out to those city commissioners meetings and be a part of that and see what goes on, get involved in your, get involved in the politics in your city. Um, we talked a minute ago kind of about the mayor's role. Now we'll kind of look at the chief of police, kind of what he does and what they're um, requires. And actually, one thing before we move on, the, the one thing people might not know is that the mayor of Salisaw actually does not have a salary. That's right. There's no it's yearly salary. Volunteer. Exactly right. For the Salisaw chief of police, the salary is actually set by a resolution, and the current one is set at $54,105.87. Uh, the Salisaw chief of police holds an office for a three year elected period. Uh, part of the police department is they provide law enforcement, community policy, um, school resource activities for the community. Officers are dedicated to serving and protecting the community. Uh, police officers, they are also, uh, the police department is guided by the elected chief of police. The department is divided into animal welfare, dispatch, investigations, and patrol. There are currently 23 patrol officers, including the chief of police in Salisaw. The police officers enforce all laws and city ordinances. They are in charge of the dispatch and emergency services after our utility services and prevention of animal cruelty. The, so the department also works with Salisaw Public Schools to provide school resource officers assigned in various campuses across uh, Salisaw. These officers receive special training before being placed in a school. Uh, that's kind of the rule of what the chief of police does, and uh, that's kind of why we're here tonight, is to really get an idea of what uh, these two candidates, uh, Sandy Gardner and Terry Franklin, kind of what they're going to bring to the table if elected chief of police. Um, opening statements, they kind of showed the biggest thing is they really want to bring about a, a positive, uplifting environment to the police force, um, and we really want to encourage people to get out and, and and to support this, to support your police, that's what they do. They, they protect you, they serve you, and uh, we want you to also be involved in this as much as you can be. So um, be sure, on, a, be sure on, a le on February 11th, let me get the words out here, on February 11th, be sure to get Absolutely. out and vote because this is very, very important to you and for the next three years of Chief of Police. That's exactly right, Kyle. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Salisville Chamber of Commerce Political Forum 2014 on the mix. 105.1. All right, thank you very much, and welcome back to uh, the candidate forum. We're going to get started now with uh, a question for uh, the m race for the mayor, and we will start out with uh, Ms. Julie Ferguson. This question will be a three-minute uh, question. Uh, the question is, uh, what are three to four major issues that you see facing the city within the next five years? Also, if funding is required for these issues, where do you foresee this funding coming from? 
I foresee that we need more infrastructure financing. We need our the sewer system in our older part of town is original, and I got a grant for that to, to about a couple three years ago to, to replace some sewer lines. And I think there's more that are going to be needed. We are going to uh, we're going to eventually need another water source, and so we're going to be planning on that too for to add to what Brushy Mountain can provide for us. Um, we need to uh, improve our roads and our streets. They're falling apart, and we don't have our regular maintenance like we used to have, and I, we're going to be faced with doing that as well and expanding our, um, our transportation system. The, um, the, the police department and the, and the uh, uh, fire department are always in need of equipment, and I think that we can build... Funding for that comes from U.S. Justice and also the Department of DA's Council in o Oklahoma City. Those are gr those grants are available for those kinds of improvements. But I I think that mainly we need to uh, redefine our parks so that we can create more space for younger kids in the city limits to, to uh, have a place to play and activities for the youth. We don't have a lot of opportunities for youth to have activities, so I see that as a as a need as well for our services that we provide. I think our water system is good and our distribution system is good, but it always needs improvement. It always needs upgrades and replacements, and so I think we're going to face that as one of our major issues. Thank you very much. Mr. Van? Uh, same question, and I'll, I'll read it again. Uh, what are the three to four major issues that you see facing the city within the next five years? And also, uh, if funding is required for these issues, where do you foresee this funding coming from? Okay. The, uh, you know, probably the biggest issue that's out there uh, that, that has been talked about for uh, many years now is the water issue. We've addressed uh, two-thirds of the problem, that being the uh, water treatment facility being a supply line and the intake facility on Brushy Lake. That was that was two legs of the three needed. Water supply is by far probably the most critical issue in South South's future. Funding for that is a challenge. Funding will probably have to come through either a reallocation of sales tax that currently exists, uh, you know, mainly for other uh, other uses at this time, and probably a combination of rates. That's that's the real fact. So uh, if we, if we expect to uh, have a future water supply, we're going to have to make them invest. And if anybody tells you they're going to do it with lower rates, they're not telling you the truth. So uh, so we're going to wind up paying for it. We've been very fortunate in the South to have affordable rates. Uh, when you look around and compare ourselves to uh, other communities similar in size, other other areas of the country, uh, we, we compare very favorably in, in the cost of our water. Uh, the other issues, uh, if I'm is correct, uh, sewer will always remain an issue. It's an issue in every community in Oklahoma, whether it's large or small. Uh, regulations continue to increase, uh, which hopefully results in a better environment for everyone. But along with those regulations come, uh, comes the cost to go with it. So we'll have to look at uh, improvements as, on, on that issue as well. Um, one of the issues we need to keep developing our industrial park, we need to look for future opportunities for growth uh, because companies aren't necessarily always looking for industrial park, but they're looking for new greenfield developments, land that's not developed currently, uh, that exists probably on the edge of town, but could be developed. So we have to, you know, keep in mind that uh, companies like flexibility, but they want to see a facility that exists. And so the more we can do there, the better off we are. Uh, streets, again, a city never gets done fixing streets and making streets better. And we continue to uh, try to improve those. Again, funding's a challenge. You know, this, this, there's no allocation of state funds for streets in a community. So the community has to try to do it out of its general fund budget. Uh, but... One of the, you know, as, as we see issues out here, JT sites obviously is an issue. Uh, part of that is the progress that's being made with the investments Cherokee Nation's made out here in new health care facilities. Uh, their construction certainly helped to the decline of this roadway, and I'm sure our school will add to that a little bit. On the other side, we get improved facilities that will greatly serve the needs of our citizens. So uh, those are our challenges. Um, funding is always going to be critical, but again, we only have two sources of municipality, sales taxes and rates. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're going to move across the aisle now and ask a question for the uh, chief of police candidate. Uh, the first question will go to uh, Ms. Sandy Gertner. Uh, 
the first question, one of the concerns of the police department has been a lack of morale lately. Uh, what will you do to help raise morale in the police department? It's no secret that our lack of morale has been really low for the last year. It has really come up in the last few months. The morale of the officers together, working together, has really changed. And I think as long as we continue to work together, the morale will go better and higher every time. All right, Mr. Franklin, I'll repeat the question. Uh, one of the concerns of the police department has been a lack of morale. What will you do to help raise morale in the police department? Well, the first thing we need to do is get everybody on the same page. When I'm the chief, I'm going to bring everybody in. We're going to start from a clean slate. We're going to treat people like we'd want to be treated. I mean, that's what this is all about. It's called community policing. You'll have better morale if you've got better contact, and better relations with the community. We've got a bunch of good officers here. I've worked with just about every one of them. We've got a few new ones that I'm not familiar with. But the morale, that, that starts from inside the department. And you've got to, the, the guys, they've got to realize that we work for the people. And if we're out here doing that, showing the people that we care, they're going to start giving a little more positive back to us. That's going to help the morale also. And uh, just uh, just the uh, fighting, infighting, we, we need to stop that. And, uh, you know, uh, we live here. This is our home. And, uh, and just knowing that helps the morale. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to move back to uh, the mayoral race. And the, first, the second question will be... Uh, to Mr. Van. Uh, this is also a three-minute question. It said, we received several questions dealing with lack of jobs in the Salisaw area. This has been a subject of debate for decades across rural communities especially. What steps can we make to help improve our chances of gaining good employers going forward, and what do you feel is currently stopping our growth? I think the lack of jobs is a concern across the country and it's a challenge that every community faces, and particularly the smaller rural communities face. The, uh, you know, everybody wants a quick fix. There are no quick fixes. What we have to do as a community, uh, Julie mentioned earlier, the uh, what things, what, what do employers look for? And I would, I would say without a doubt, labor force is by far probably the most important issue that a company looks for. And they want to see a labor force that has higher education, uh, that... Uh, that exist in the population. That's a challenge for all of rural Oklahoma, including this community. So we have to continue to invest dollars in our in our higher education. Uh, Mr. Farmer's here, and we, we certainly want to invest all we can in, in, in primary school education, but but until we uh, in, encourage our workforce to proceed on and, and, and get that college degree, we're going to continue to face challenges in finding the higher paying jobs. Uh, that's just a fact. If you look across the country, the higher paying jobs, you'll, you'll have a better educated workforce. So that's that's our first first issue. We need to keep investing dollars like we have out Carl Albert out here. The communities invested those dollars from from your sales tax dollars to improve that facility. We've got to keep continue doing that. Uh, second issue is make sure the infrastructure is here. The water supply, uh, the treatment distribution system continues to be uh, an area that we have to improve. Um, we've seen that just recently. We're going to have to improve a water line to serve the east end of the community. Yes, this concern is brought about by the sports complex. But an even bigger concern is that there would be nothing even that could be developed further out there without an improvement like this in the future. So, so that is a major concern. So we've got to continue doing that. Those are the two biggest issues. Of course, transportation is going to be a bigger issue as well. Uh, we, we always think about our local streets, but within the next uh, up to 2020, uh, the state of Oklahoma, fortunately, has us slated for improvements at both the 308 and 311 interchanges, as well as the improvement of Highway 59 North from uh, Cherokee Avenue, uh, also known as Wheeler. So we, uh, we're we very fortunate. We'll be working with the state on those projects. Again, the easier it is to get in and out of our community, the better it is for a distribution facility 
uh, or a similar facility located in our community. So uh, the last thing I would say is we continue to outreach, uh, to reach out to businesses uh, that are w willing to look, you know, look at relocating. We work with the Department of Commerce state, at the state level, uh, but we also have to look within ourselves, and we've done that by helping our local business expand. So we've had a great relationship with SLW. They continue to invest dollars out there, and we're very fortunate that they came in and took that operation over from Board Warner. Uh, of course, we've also had success with Telephone, and they continue to add jobs, and they've also added a product line out there that will ensure their future here in the community. So, that's it. Thank you. Ms. Ferguson, I'll uh, repeat the question again. Uh, we received several questions dealing with the lack of jobs in the Thalassau area. This has been a subject of debate for decades across rural communities especially. What steps can we make to help improve our chances of gaining good employers going forward, and what do you feel is currently stopping our growth? The mayor is correct, and we need good a good workforce, and we do have a workforce, but our workforce parameter is enlarged because we have access to citizens in Arkansas just across the border that we can, if we have a large employer, we do have that to call, to, uh, call upon. I was privileged to be invited by SLW to for their Christmas dinner this past uh, December. They asked me to help them with their 40-year celebration next year. They're going to bring in more companies. I met the people from China. They're going to bring in more, more lines that they're going to be building. I want to talk to the uh, corporate people in Detroit and to see what they need as a supplier to help this local plant. That's how we will build our local industry uh, and for our skilled labor. We have opportunities for other companies that we can visit with that are suppliers in that automotive uh, industry. I know where to go to do that, and I think we can recruit and offer them, uh, make, make, a, make an offer to them that they can come here with some uh, incentive uh, to be uh, a supplier to SLW in, the, in our industrial park. We have room for them, we have a need for them, and we can, we can treat our other industries the same way, but I think we need to start with SLW and help them grow. They're on a, they're on a new, new product line that is going to continue to increase, and that would, could be a start that would lead to other, other businesses and industries that we could bring in. Thank you. All right, the second question for the Chief of Police race, uh, and this time we'll start with uh, Mr. Terry Franklin. Okay. There have been ongoing discussions regarding uh, closing the city jail in favor of utilizing the county jail. Uh, what is your stance on this issue? Well, I'm against it. The voters, the citizens of South Hall back, I don't remember the years, probably back in the 90s, they uh, worked hard, and I don't think this jail cost anything. I think we end up getting it with grants. I think that's what Chief Craig had told me. But I know what it's like to be at South Hall. I started in 1988. We didn't have a police department. We drove around. We worked out of our cars. If we needed to go to the office, we'd go to City Hall. We always had to take our inmates to the county jail. You know, it's a 10-day holding facility. And after 10 days, they're, if they're there any longer, they're transferred to the county. But most of them work their fine off. You know, I know the budget at the jail is probably about jail and dispatch. Last time I was there, it was around $500,000. Well, quite a bit of that's salary. And there's some in there for supplies and stuff like that. But I think the people, we, uh, we built the police department with the jail because that was our intent to have a jail. And I don't think the public... When they get looking at the bottom line, and once everything's put out there, I don't know all the details on the transferring or anything like that, but it's going to cost us to house prisoners at the county. They're not going to do it free. They've, they've got an overhead also. We've already got it. We've got the people. I don't know why we'd want to change it. The only thing I can see we could do is maybe improve the way we do things. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gardner, I'll read the, read the question again. Uh, there's been ongoing discussions re regarding closing the city jail in favor of utilizing the county jail. What is your stance on the issue? I disagree with cho closing the, the... I'm sorry, read that again. Uh, the, 
been ongoing discussions regarding closing the city jail in favor of using the county jail. I'm sorry. I am not in agreement with closing the city jail. Uh, it serves such a purpose for being there. It, we have uh, it, the city jail has the ability to um, have someone come out. I'm sorry. Just, I'm trying to get my, my thoughts in, in my words, and I apologize. If we close the city jail, then we're giving up all of our um, availability for the um, ambulance service, for our availability in the um, 911 service in our area. If we close it down, then it's only taken away from what we, we do now. And, and Terry's right. It was, whenever it was st uh, started years ago, that was the purpose of the, the jail, was to have the facility for a 10-day holding facility. And if you take that away then, and make it all into a different area, then you're going to lose what purpose we have for the 10-day facility. And then we're going to be moving those prisoners over to the county, and it will be taken away from what we stand for on that. Thank you very much. All right, we'll move on to the uh, third question for uh, Mr. Van and Ms. Ferguson. I believe Ms. Ferguson is up. Yes, sir. Ms. Ferguson, you're first up this time. Uh, the question is, what guiding principles will you use to deal with the negative situations that will arise in the future? I think we need to implement more diplomacy uh, all around uh, in the community, uh, in the police department, in City Hall, in, in the way that we do business, is that we... Uh, when controversy arises, and it, and it does because we're human, and I think there, there is a professional and a courteous way to handle problems, and communication is a key uh, to stay focused on what it, the issues are and to stay focused on what our mission is and to stay focused on the service that we are, are put in place to uh, provide for the citizens of the city. I think when controversy arises, there's, it's, a, it's a sign of a need that needs to be addressed. And I think the quicker it can be addressed in a professional manner, uh, the, the best possible solution can be found. Thank you very much. Mr. Van, I'll repeat the question. Uh, what guiding principles will you use to deal with negative situations that will arise in the future? Uh, not that we've ever had any negative situations in Dallas, so everybody's always positive. I never get any negative phone calls. So the uh, I think the most important principle is is, is communication with people, and in in, in when they call you, that you listen to their problems. Uh, sometimes they may be right, sometimes they may be wrong, uh, but you you first have to start listening to them, see if you can even determine what the problem is. So so yes, we do have to do a good job of listening as as council members, as city manager. Uh, that that. A role we play, so we hopefully we're we're doing that to some degree. The overall principles is, you know, we have to as leaders as leaders in our community, we have to maintain our character and our integrity at all times. Um, trust me, that can be a challenge at times. You know, when when things aren't going well, and, and uh, you know, in the heat of the moment, sometimes you uh, you kind of want to lose your religion, so to speak. And uh, I think we all face that as a daily battle for us. And whatever situations are in our lives, but uh, uh, but we have to remember who we are, what we believe, and and try to maintain good character at all times. And, you know, I, I appreciate the chamber years several years back for starting a character first program, encouraging businesses. I know the city city government was involved in that to stress the importance of good character in our employees and how you treat people around you every day. So we're humans. We fail. We fail often. Uh, but as long as we have in the back of our head that, hey, I know I failed, 
and tomorrow I'm going to wake up and I'm going to try to do better. That is the guiding principle we have to live by. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Van. We'll move on to the third question for the, uh, the chief of police race, and this time, uh, Ms. Gardner, you'll be up first. The question uh, that we received from several people is, please discuss how ethics play a role in your job, and what do you expect ethically from those that are under your supervision? Ethics should be the most important thing that they carry in their job. It's important that people know that they are truthful, honest, and that their integrity stands for who they are. Those that you work with should have that same goal, should have that same feeling. If your goal and your ethics are marred in some way, then that's going to should be a part of of um, how you see things. But if you're trustworthy and, and your integrity is intact, then your ethics will stand. Thank you. Mr. Franklin, I'll uh, repeat the question. Uh, please discuss how ethics play a role in your job and what do you expect ethically from those that are under your supervision? Well, ethics, that's why we're police officers. I mean, if you don't have good ethics, you probably don't need to be a police officer. That's my opinion. Our job is to protect and serve. You know, if you got guys out here, they have bad ethics. It affects everybody in our community, and they're not going to work for me if I'm the chief. Now, if i got a guy out here, he's got some issues, we're going to try to fix them, but if he if he doesn't want to fix them and his ethics are that, that terrible, I don't think you as citizens want him on our police department. And uh, I mean, that's the bottom line. You, we were only as good as our word, and if you, if you get up here or you're out there telling people things, that's ethics. You know, treat people like you want to be treated. I mean, that's, we're, we're a community. Most of us know everybody here, you know, and that's a, that's a good thing. You know, I've gone to a bunch of symposiums in the past where they try to treat, teach us uh, community policing. I recall the first one I went to, they was telling us all this stuff, and I looked at uh, Larry Lamb. He was my assistant chief, then. that's been a while back. I said, Larry, we already do that. We are a community policing organization, and ethically, if you if you have a good organization and a bunch of good guys, you're you're probably going to have decent ethical officers. And if you don't, you need to take care of it. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, the last two questions that we're actually going to ask of uh, of each of you, uh, because they do they do have an impact um, on uh, on both the races in in my opinion. The uh, First question, and it will be for uh, Mr. Van first. Uh, we've seen recently uh, consolidation between the east and west side of the county's 911 system. Uh, do you feel the city should also utilize the 911 system as uh, dispatch or continue using a separate dispatcher as is currently uh, being done? And this is three minutes, sorry. Three minutes, okay. <laughs> Surely I won't take that long. So. 911, I've never heard anything about it for 20 years now. It's been, uh, been quite a challenge for, for the uh, entire county. So uh, recently efforts uh, have been made in the past past year or so to combine the 911 systems, and uh, I think financials uh, finally forced that consolidation, uh, which ultimately will benefit the entire county to have one single 911 system. The challenge for the, the city as far as, uh, you know, we already use 911 directly for dispatching our fire trucks. So if you call 911 today, uh, they can page our fire department out. And their dispatchers communicate with our fire department directly. There's no intermediary to go between. Uh, the same is not true of our police. If you call 911 today, they have to transfer it just as a regular phone call would be transferred. Uh, where our police department will pick up the phone. Uh, 
uh, they'll have to get the information from you again, and they will be blind to the information that 911 can see on their end. That's not a good situation to be in. So I think we should do like many other communities do, uh, and particularly much larger communities do, and have one central dispatch. I think it could be done. There are challenges. It's not easy. You have to work out the details regarding the employees, who they work for, how they're structured, the governing body that oversees that. And then you have the challenge as well of if we're going to lose because we have combination jail dispatchers, uh, you know, that creates a situation for us where we have to consider whether or not we have a jail open or not. And when we do that, then we have to consider contracting with the county for housing of our prisoners on municipal charges. Okay. Now, if, if you get arrested on a murder charge, the county is going to, we're going to wind up taking you to the county jail anyway, because that's a state charge. But on simple municipal charges, something like public intox, where you might spend the night or a few hours, uh, if we're going to use the county, then we have to work out an agreement with the sheriff's office. That comes with its own complications. You don't have to look any farther than Tulsa County to see what complications arise from that. So you have to have a lot of faith between city government and county government that you can work together, and the sheriff's office that you can work together to resolve the housing issue. You know, we, uh, I know they were asked a question about the jail issue, and, and it is a concern, and whether we should operate our own jail or, or use the county jail. I think it's more efficient to have one jail. And I would remind people that we're already paying a county sales tax that goes towards the operation and funding the operation of the jail. And last time I looked, it provided more than enough funds to pay for that operation of jail at full capacity with full staff. So that's an issue that all communities in our county need to consider. I think we're already paying the cost for that jail to be operated. Uh, yes, there are other charges such as medical care and other things that we might have to address as a city using that facility. Uh, but it is a challenge, uh, but it's something that I'm open to and will be willing to work for. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ferguson, I'll repeat the question. Uh, we've seen recent consolidation between the east and west side of the county's 911 systems. Do you feel the city should also utilize the 911 system as dispatch or continue using a separate dispatcher as is currently being done? I think that is an issue that we could take a look at pretty strongly, but I know how the peop most of the people in the city feel like we need our own uh, dispatch. Uh, I was a part of the first 911 committee that came up with the 911 program years ago. Um, they had two separate on either end. It didn't work at all. They've combined those, which has created a much better system to work with. I think that w we need our own 911 uh, system in our jail, in our police department, but I'm not opposed to looking at ways to work with the county to see what is the most feasible and the cost effective. The main concern is protecting our citizens from our dispatch and our police department and our fire department. And I know the fire department already goes the other way, but it's a matter of knowing your community and knowing where to send them. And right now, I think I would not be totally opposed to it, but I would want to have a lot more information before we would go down that road. And I think the uh, the police department needs to be involved in it and a review of the system and how it best affects our, our, our citizens. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Franklin, we're going to be asking you the same question now, and I'll repeat the question. Uh, we've seen recent consolidation between the east and west ends of the county's 911 systems. Do you feel the city should also utilize the 911 system as dispatch or continue using the separate dispatcher as it's currently being done? I like the way it's currently done. Matter of fact, like I said earlier, I work at the sheriff's office now. And the sheriff, we just uh, built a new dispatch center because we're not going to use 911 for that. What they do right now, they monitor our channel. And they notify our officers anytime they have a 911 call. What we've got over at 911 is they're just call takers. They're not dispatchers. They don't even get the address a lot of times where something's going on. So a lot of times we'll lose that in the radio transmission or the phone. They'll transfer it to our dispatch, and they don't they disconnect them or whatever. The thing is, at one time we had a 911 terminal at South Hall Police Department, and the way that worked was any time a 911 call came in, we had to have a dispatcher in there all the time. It rang over so many times it would automatically roll back over to the county's dispatcher. That way it was always manned. And then if, if it did roll back over, our dispatcher would see that if they didn't get to the 
to answer it at the right amount of time. Well, they could go online, and they could listen to this call going on, and if they needed to, they could take it over or whatever. You know, uh, the biggest thing about this merge is I know it's about trying to save money. Like I said earlier, the budget for the police department, and I don't know what it was this last year, but the year before last, because I took care of that type of stuff, the police department, our budget was $500,000. Well, you know, if you merge over there, well, well, let me just say this. The county decided not to merge with 911 because it's going to cost them $11,000 more a month just to dispatch. And they weren't going to be dispatchers. They were going to be call takers. You know, if you're going to have a 911 system like they have in Tulsa or something like that, it'd be a good deal if it, if it works. But you've got to get everybody involved. You can't go do these things when it's dealing with law enforcement without including them. Because we're the ones answering these calls. We know what the we know what kind of problems are. Uh nine one one people or people on the well I'll just say the council. They're 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 not out in the field. They don't know what the issues are and they if they'd include these other people, it it would might make a better transition if you're gonna go to that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gertner, I'll repeat the question again as well. Uh, we've seen recent consolidation between the east and west side of the county's 911 systems. Do you feel the city should also utilize the 911 system as dispatch or continue using a separate dispatcher as is currently being done? I feel we should continue use, using separate dispatchers. The reason being is because the city on, has so many different position, um, so many different places that are needed at different times. The electric department needs a call out. The fire department needs a call out. The water department, diamond net, sewer. Each one of those are individuals, and they're they're called out individually whenever they're needed, whenever they're having a problem. Citizens of Salisaw, if you change that and put it all to the county, then that's going to separate what they already have, in my opinion. I know I like having, as a citizen of Salisaw, I like having that, knowing that they're there for me, that they're there for the citizens of Salisaw, that they're going to react separately whenever something's done instead of through the county. I know there's been times whenever we've had, at the police department, we've had a call come through and it'd be a 911 call and they transfer it and don't get a phone. They have a hang up and they don't get a, a phone number, they don't get a name, anything like that. So sometimes that call is lost that way. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I didn't think everyone was going to uh, go the same route on that one. Huh? <laughs> the uh, the last question uh, is, again, a, a question for all four of you. And uh, forgive me if I've got the numbers wrong because I don't quite have all the notes here, but uh, the last numbers that I had seen said that out of the uh, uh, 298 uh police forces in the state of Oklahoma, that there were only three elected police chiefs, and 295 of them were appointed. Uh, so the, the question going forward, and it will be first for Ms. Ferguson, is how do you feel about the appointed versus elected uh, chief of police? And is that something that you feel needs you know, any action taken on it? And this, again, will be a three-minute. Thank you. I think that's something that the citizens of Salisaw voted to have, and I think that's a question that the citizens of Salisaw needs to vote on. I do think that our charter needs to be upgraded because the years ago when that was on the charter, it failed twice. And they went back and changed the charter to change the police chief um, part of it, of the charter, but they didn't change the administrative procedures for it. Consequently, there's been conflict ever since. So we need to take a, a, a different uh, approach. 
look at our charter, change our charter to allow the form of police department and, and police chief that the people prefer. Uh, I'm, I'm good with either one, but I think it needs to be settled, and I think it needs to be cleaned up, and I think it needs to be clear. It isn't, and it cre- continues to create controversy. So I agree that it needs to be changed, but I still think that the people of the, of the city need that opportunity to make that choice. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Vance, same question, dealing with uh, appointment versus elected uh, police, uh, chief of police. This has been a uh, topic for a number of years, and it's been something I've had to deal with early on after being after my first term uh, in office as mayor. So, and uh, sometimes today I think my position has been misrepresented by by different people in the community. But let me be clear: I've always been for an appointed police chief. That's my personal opinion. But let me also be clear: that is the people's choice. They get to choose what kind of government they want to have. That's the great thing about our charter. That's that's the line set up in state law: self governance by the people, you choose what you want to have. Now, let me say this. As an elected official, my job is to point out problems. And when I see a problem, uh, particularly in the police department, with the leadership in the police department, then it's my job to point that out. One of the issues we have with the police chief is, is simple. It's not, I don't care who's there. I don't care what their name is. I don't care what their race is. I don't care what their gender is. I don't care whose family they're from. So what I want is somebody that's qualified, that's going to be of high character, good morals, good ethics, and that's going to be professional in how they how they conduct themselves and how they manage the department. That's all I'm asking for. And so right right now, today, the qualifications to be police chief in Salisbury is to have a GED, 25 years of age, and have basic police certification. You can literally go to complete certification training as a rookie police officer, run for police chief, and take over the department at the next election having no management experience, very little time on the street as an officer. I don't think that's right. I think it's ridiculous. I don't think anybody would hire somebody in a McDonald's to cook french fries today and make them CEO next year. It just doesn't make sense, folks. So having said that, it's your choice. And and I'm always going to be for you having a choice. I'm not going to be bringing the issue up. I think if the people want to see the change, they're going to bring it up. So I would encourage you to take a look at that issue. You vote however you want to feel on it. If, you, if you're interested in changing it, then bring it up. Make it an issue. Bring it before the council. But, again, it's your choice as to what you want to do with that. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to do the same question, um, and I believe Ms. Gerdner is first this time. No. Oh, sorry, Mr. Franklin. And the question deals with the appointed versus uh, elected chief of police. Well, it's pretty obvious where I stand on it. I mean, I'm running for chief. I, <laughs> I hope my opponent feels that way, too. You know, uh, the people have voted on it a couple times in the past. And, I mean, it was been several years ago. You know, my thing is, if that's what the people want, that's what we're going to do. But I'd like to see one thing I'd like to see the council do. I'd like to bring, see them to bring the charter to the people to correct the charter so the chief can run his office because that's what you elected him to do or her. You didn't elect him, the chief to let somebody else run your department. You know, it's just like the sheriff. We hire the sheriff. He runs the department. You know, if the, if the chief can't run it, it'll be pretty obvious. And the way you get rid of him is in the next election. And that's that's, uh, that's my view on it. I'm for it. I mean, if the if the council and the bring it to the public and the public decide that we want to have an appointed chief, then that's what the people chose. But uh, they haven't up to this day, and that's why we're up here tonight. And uh, and I, I'm for it. But I'd like to see it change so the chief can be in control, not not somebody else. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gerdner, this will be the same question and uh, dealing with uh, appointed versus elected chief of police. Thank you. We've gone through what we did with the election board on the two situations where we went to court. Yes, I, I agree that we need to have um, the 
citizens make the choice. The choice of having an elected chief. Obviously, I believe that or I wouldn't be here today. I stand behind that because I, I knew what the charter said. I knew how it proposed to the city, what was said in the charter. I also believe the charter should be updated just to verify what it meant. The situation with the, the election board in the beginning of my race, it, it was a little uh, upsetting not to know whether I was going to run or not, but that's the way that, that it was perceived, so I was told how it was going to be run. But I think citizens should have the right to choose who they want to be chief. That is the right that, they, that we have in this state, and so I'm all for having an uh, elected chief. Thank you very much. I appreciate everyone answering uh, answering the questions that we had for you, and we're going to move on now to the uh, to your final comments. Uh, each of you will be given uh, three minutes for the final comments, and we're going to go in uh, in the reverse order of the way that we started the uh, introductory comments, and we'll start with Mr. Shannon Van. Well, again, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. It shows that you have an interest in your community and, uh, and that you care about what, uh, what goes on in your community. So I also want to thank uh, Squaw County Times. Jeff got on to me after early on there about uh, they also sponsor this event. So I want to throw a plug in for him as well, so, as well as the Mix 105.1 again and the South Hall Chamber, of course. So the, uh, the choice you make as citizens, uh, you know, no matter what choice you make tonight, um, will will last for three years. <laughs> so uh, whether whether you think uh, you're a candidate one or not, uh, you only got three years to look forward to. But, um, I've been proud of what accomplishments have been made by the council, by you, the people, in supporting the issues that we brought to you for your support financially. We don't do anything as a, as community leaders that that you don't ultimately support with your tax dollars. And what we try to do is use those tax dollars the best way we can to get the most bang for your buck. Again, some people think we fail at that. Others think we succeed at it. But we always should try to make our best effort, and I think we do that. The, uh, the, the concerns tonight that have been expressed in the questions are, are nothing new to you, I don't think, either one of us. So it's the same concerns we've heard repeatedly over the years. You can go back to the town, time the town was founded, and you'll see concerns about streets, Talking in the newspaper, you'd see concerns about street crews showing up on Saturday to fix the, fix the dirt roads in town. Um, so those are always concerns. The municipal concerns don't change. Funding always remains a challenge. We basically have two, two things to fund your improvements with. Your rates, because we own our own utility systems here in Salisaw, and your tax dollars provided by sales tax revenue. So, again, our challenge is to continue using those dollars efficiently, we need to try to continue to make improvements to our facilities to attract retail growth as well as industrial growth. Retail growth obviously adds sales tax dollars back into our government, uh, which will help us make the needed improvements in the roads, the water, sewers, those type of things to support the rates that you already pay. So, again, I, I think we've done a, a, a good job, but I think we also can do better. And that's the challenge that, you know, when we uh, go to sleep at night, that's usually on my head is what can we do tomorrow to make it better. So... I appreciate your support over the years, and I ask for your continued support in this election, and hopefully we'll see Salisall uh, be a better place to live in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Ferguson, you have three minutes. Thank you. And I want again to thank everyone who came out for this tonight and thank the Chamber Legislative Committee for hosting it and thank the sponsors, the newspapers, Squaw County Times, and the radio station. Uh, for helping us get this message out to the citizens who could not be here. I, I, want to, I want to look at different ways of doing business. I think we need greater transparency in our city operations and our government to get, allow citizens more opportunity to participate if they wish to. 
I think we need to develop a program for high school and college student intern program. I did this with NSU several years ago to help students learn that they can be of service in the community and that they can have a career in the community at any level of government. Uh, we had some very bright students. They did a lot of good work for us. didn't cost us anything except some time and effort and training. They came up with some good programs for our community. I would like to, tra I would like to revisit that and, and get high school students involved uh, at, on doing the same project. I would like to create a proactive ambassador group of business people because I think uh, we focus on recruitment and we cannot wait on Department of Commerce and us request for proposals for possible people coming into the state. We need, we've reached the point that we need, to, we need to seek outside participation, outside businesses. What can we bring to this part of the country that would make it viable and profitable for your community? I think we need to discuss things with SLW. I plan to do this over the next year, working with them for our 40-year uh, operation here, and to see what kind of suppliers they need that we could recruit and help move to Salisaw to, to make their cost uh, more uh, efficient and profitable. And then that way they continue to grow and the suppliers can move in. We've got the workforce. We've got the will, we've got the knowledge, we have the people, we have the dreams. And I think together we can grow. There are many things that we can do together. But I think we need to, to involve you with some of the activities that we have and the, some of the plans that we have and give you an opportunity to serve if you have an interest. I thank you again, and I appreciate the honor of being here and, and uh, the, ma making the opportunity available for you to have a choice because uh, it is your decision. And I appreciate you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ferguson. And we will move on to the Chief of Police, and I believe we'll be starting with Mr. Franklin. And you'll have uh, three minutes. Okay, thank you. I'd like to thank everyone that came out here tonight, everyone that listened on the radio, watched on Diamond Net, and also the newspaper. I'd also like to thank Sandy, my opponent, for being here. I'm the only candidate qualified to address the necessary ch changes required for our police department so it can flourish into the future. Time is now. I'm asking each one of you to vote for Terry Franklin for Chief of Police on Tuesday, February 11, 2014. Thank you, and God bless each and every one of you. Thank you. And Ms. Gardner, you'll have three minutes. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I do thank the Chamber of Commerce. I thank the um, Mix 105.1. I thank the County Times. And I thank each one of you. The citizens that live here in Salisaw, no, most of most of you know me because I've I've lived and worked in this community almost all my life. As I always strive to work hard, I do that in a, on a daily basis. I don't just stop when the job's done. I find something else to do. The police department has allowed me to grow as a person. It's allowed me to grow as a parent. It's allowed me to have many friends that help me along the way. I raised my kids here, and I'm proud of that. I'm proud that they were part of this city. The forum has taught me something that I never knew possible. I had never attended one of the forums here before, so I really didn't know what to expect. I tried to tell myself, do this, do that, but I have to tell you, I learned more tonight, and I thank you for that. I thank the forum for that. Because whenever you come out to something like this, you can't prepare yourself for everything you want to do, everything you want to know. You 
meet the public, you work with the public, you talk to the public. That is what the city of Salisbury is about. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate all of you for uh, answering the question so candidly and for uh, for being kind to one another. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Jeff Mayo is going to give some closing remarks. Well, I want to thank uh, Marley Abel again for being our moderator, for Judy Martins and Gary Wenton for running the timing and the clock, and I think the candidates did a great job of operating within our boundaries. Um, and I also, want again, want to thank People, Inc. for allowing us to use their conference center for tonight's program. If you all have been around town, we, our town, you know, despite what you might think, we're growing enough that we don't have enough large buildings available to have an event like this. So we're very lucky to have People, Inc. Uh, offer their space uh, to us tonight. Um, and I also want to thank the candidates again for being here, for the mix. Um, <laughs> easy. For those on the radio, Marla just held up the one minute. I was on my last 30 seconds. Arkansas and Kentucky kicks off in 10 minutes. <laughs> kicks off or, or tips, tips off? off yeah. All right. Okay, anyway, thanks Neither to the mix. Neither of those schools have a football team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thanks to the mix. You can listen to this again on kxmx.com, and also it will be on Diamond Net Channel 19 tomorrow. Please vote February 11th. Thank you. All right, we're back now from East Kennedy's Political Forum. What you just heard were our four candidates for the municipal offices, two candidates for mayor, and two candidates for chief of police. We hope you enjoyed tonight's debate. And I tell you what, you know, I think we've covered everything, Kyle, except for we want to quickly go over, we promised we would go over some of the qualifications for these two positions here tonight. So I'm going to start off with the chief of police shall be elected at large. Now, this is according to the Salisaw City Charter. The chief of police shall be elected at large by qualified electors of the city of Salisaw. No person shall be eligible. That's no person shall be eligible to the Office of Chief of Police of Salisaw, unless he has been a resident of the city for at least one year prior to his election, not less than a 25 years of age, and has a high school diploma or a GED equivalent certification, and has completed a basic police course policy or class in the number of hours required by statute for full-time salary police or peace officers. And I think you have the qualifications for mayor. Absolutely. Looking at the qualifications for the mayor of the city of Salisaw, one member of the Board of Commissioners shall be elected at large by the qualified electors of the city of Salisaw, which commissioner will be known and referred to as the mayor. And one member of the board shall be elected to each of the four wards of the city. Those are your commissioners. Uh, for the mayor, no person shall be eligible to an elective office of the city of Salisaw unless he is a registered voter of the city and has been a resident of the city for, one, for at least one year immediately prior to his election. So those are some of the... Uh, just some of the qualifications for the mayor of Salisaw. I tell you what, we have a lot of people here to thank. So we're wrapping this thing up. Of course, we want to thank our sponsors here on the radio. Would not be possible if not for them. We want to thank Peter's Agency Home Health, Diamond Express, Merle Check Cashing, Wright Home Services, Salisaw Lumber, and the National Bank of Salisaw, as well as we want to thank the facility. This is a beautiful facility out here. A wonderful facility. If you've never been out to People Inc. Conference Center, you definitely need to come out and check it out. This is a facility that maybe not many people in our area may actually know that exists here. Right. But if you ever get the opportunity to come out to the People Inc. Conference Center and get a look look at it, it is a huge building, a uh, lot of up-to-date, modern facility with all the projectors and the sound equipment. And it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a conference center. It absolutely is. And you know what? We're very fortunate to have a facility like this. And this is actually what the, the uh, functioning of... Uh, reason that people Inc. built this facility was was just for this for us for the community and and the different people in the community to have a place to come and go and gather and uh, just like uh, was said here tonight you know we have very few places where you can gather I think we probably had 150 maybe 200 people here tonight we have very few places that you can gather that many people and we really want to say a word of thanks to the uh, people Inc. people helping people they are we're wonderful we're very fortunate to have them here in our community and we certainly want to thank them for allowing us uh, uh, to use their facility. They set up everything here, Kyle. We had an IT man here for two days. Uh, mm -hmm. We had one here on Friday. We had one here again today. We want to thank uh, Chris Whalen for that and Donnie Poindexter. And, of course, Jim Harris, the CEO out here at People, Inc., and uh, Tony Demmer, who's over the facilities. We appreciate it. Also, Betty. Betty's always the one you talk to. Yes. And, and, yes. And so she always takes care of you. She always takes care <laughs> of you. That's right. So. We want to thank Betty. 
But uh, this is a wonderful facility. We think everyone works hard to help bring this to the people. We hope you've enjoyed this tonight. You know, this is what we're all about here at the Mix. We are about bringing you local events in and around our area. I think we added up the other day, and in 60 days we've been to 37 different <laughs> events here in Sequoia County. But, you know, that's what we do. And we, uh, one of the things I wanted to say real quick was just we want to thank the Chamber of Commerce for putting this event on, and we thank them for, for working as hard as they do to be able to, for us to come out here and to be able to have events like this. And for the biggest thing while we have this event is just for the listeners. And we want to definitely get you and remind you that February 11, 2014, is the election date for the Salas Falls City Municipal Election and also school board elections. And uh, basically at the mix, we want, you to be, we want you to be in the know on all things when it comes to your local politics because they play a huge part, a huge part in your everyday life. And we want you to have the most information you can um, from the from the politi- from the politicians themselves and the information that we can bring to you, whether it's from the you know different city charters or different city meetings, uh, we want you to be in the know. We want you to know all things, and that's why we love doing what we do here at the mix and, and bringing you all these information. And we want to remind you, February 11th, get out and vote, and we'll actually have those results live for you right here on the mix. Uh, that's right. We're going to bring election to you, results live to you as we always do the very night of the election. As soon as the election board gets them in. We'll be reporting those elections. Also, we have an interview week that's coming up. We want to make sure and tell them about that, Kyle. We're going to be uh, hosting an interview week. That will be the week, the full week before the date of the election, where we'll each uh, have a noon time. We're going to spend about 10 or 15 minutes with each candidate, and uh, one candidate will be on Monday, one on Tuesday, so forth and so on, until we get these four candidates and uh, let you hear them uh, in the interview process. And that will be at your lunchtime every day, so you be sure to tune in. Don't miss that, because... I'm going to get to sit down with actually these candidates and ask some of these a little more, um, maybe a little more in-depth question or maybe more the question that didn't get asked tonight. We may look in those questions, but we're going to. That's I'm looking forward to it because I get to spend you know 10, 15 minutes with these candidates and really talk to them and really figure out uh, and find out all the information I can in in these interviews and really let the people know where the politicians stand, where they're at right now, and uh, so that will be actually the, the week leading up. Election Day. We're going to have those each day of the week, um, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited about it, and I'm Absolutely. excited about having the politicians in. Absolutely, and of course, we'll be bringing you more information about that as it comes uh, becomes a, gets closer and closer on the date. Again, we want to thank our sponsors, and then we're going to wrap things up from here. Peters Agency Home Health, Diamond Express, Merle, Merle Check Cashing, Right Home Services, Salisaw Lumber, the National Bank of Salisaw. Thanks to People Inc. for letting us host this facility or letting us host this forum. Out here tonight, thanks to all the candidates who showed up and just everyone that makes a a broadcast like this possible and an event like this possible. That's going to do it for us. For Kyle, I am D, and we are wrapping things up. Thanks again for listening to the Political Forum 2014. You're listening to The Mix 105.1.